And this one, we're going to have a case study in focus, which runs in the competition section here at the CPH Docs Film Festival um, after winning the Special Jury Award for Cinema Verité Filmmaking at Sundance this year also. Is the post-truth era a struggle for documentary? Or does a contemporary cinema verité hold more power than ever before? So we have with us, live from New York, the founder and director of the documentary program of the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY, Yoruba Richen. She is also an award-winning documentary filmmaker, and her work has been featured on PBS, New York Times, Doc, Up Doc, sorry, Frontline, The Atlantic, and Field of Vision. Her latest film, How It Feels to Be Free, nice name, executively produced by Halisha Case, premiered on the PBS American Masters in January this year. She will be more than a moderator also here and lead the discussion with a non less uh, awarded Camilla Nielsen, director of President, but also of Democrats in 2014, to explore unique challenges and opportunities also of the anthropological lens. Yoruba, I let you take over post-truth Post Verite, an anthropological perspective on president. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. And nice to see you, Camila. Nice to see you too, Yoruba. Finally. Finally, exactly. Um, so I'm just going to uh, read a little bit uh, about who Camila Nielsen is and her work. Um, and then we will go to the trailer uh, from her uh, film, very important film, which I think really uh, gets at the heart of the discussion today. Um, Camila Nielsen is an award-winning independent filmmaker based in Copenhagen, Den Denmark. She holds a master's degree in visual anthropology from New York University, NYU. Her work expands across diverse topics from the trilogy on children's rights with Good Morning Afghanistan, which she made in 2003, and Durga, 2004, and The Children of Darfur, Darfur which she made in 2006, um, to bureaucracy and traffic planning in the urban comedy of Mumbai Disconnected. Her first feature documentary, Democrats, about the drafting of the new constitution in Zimbabwe has received more than 25 international awards and nominations, including best documentary at the Tribeca Film Festival. Um, and her new feature documentary, President, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in 2021, just a couple months ago, where it won the World <clears throat> Cinema Documentary Special Jury Award for Verite Filmmaking. Let's go to a trailer from that film. This is an era of upsets, right? Donald Trump meeting Hillary Clinton, Brexit in the UK. You defeating Emerson and Mungo. That would be an electoral upset on that kind of scale. Can you really see yourself pulling that off? Of course, I'm ready for it. I mean, I'm, I'm more than ready. I feel the energy. So that would change our pain. And is it? It pain. I'm not here for kisses and hugs. I'm here for a fight. We are ready for any consequence until we have a free and fair election in Zimbabwe. Change is coming, and change is coming. It cannot be denied. Those who believe in change, the world are never overcome. It's all for you, Zimbabwe! Woo! 
Today is a day of mourning. Mourning over democracy. It is a black day. These guys are making Mugabe look like a saint. These are all shots. Links. Oh my, we're at war. We're dealing with criminals. Hey, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. So this is a democracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is a coup. It's a coup. Yeah, it's a coup. This is a coup. An assassination attempt was made only last week. Chamisa has survived so many assassination attempts. Mr. Chamisa, you are the hope yes. for Zimbabwe. Yes. Please do not take that hope away from us. Hi, um, what a powerful trailer, what a powerful film. Um, I was, I had seen your film, uh, Democrats, the first film uh, about Zimbabwe. And um, it's amazing to see, you know, this to watch, it's, it was amazing to watch this film um, and see, you know, your continued documentation of uh, the fight for democracy in Zimbabwe. Uh, I'm especially interested because my first film was um, made in South Africa. So I've been following the uh, issues around in Zimbabwe for a long time now, obviously, as have you. So there's so much to dig into here. Um, my first question actually is part of documenting uh, democracy or anything, right, is getting access access to the process, access to the people. Can you tell us how you uh, were able to do that in both of these films, really? Yeah, well, to, to just start with the, and I should start by saying thank you for, for having us today. It's, a, it's a really nice as a filmmaker to be able to talk about documentary and talk about your work, not just in terms of uh, its topics, democracy in Zimbabwe, but also to talk about, you know, film and how they work and why we made them and, and how they are made. So thank you to the festival and, and to you, Yoruba, for, for taking up this subject. Um, yes, uh, there are very different scenarios in terms of how I got access to, to, to these two films, Democrats and President. Um, to start with the first one, Democrats... Uh, uh, is filmed in Zimbabwe from 2010 to 2013 when the country was in the process of writing its first democratic constitution. Um, that process took place while uh, president slash dictator Robert Mugabe was still in power and the sole aim of making that constitution from the parliamentarians, from the progressive democratic forces in Zimbabwe was actually to limit Zimbabwe's executive power. And so there's a bit of a uh, idiosyncrasy here that you write a democratic constitution while the, the, the dictator is still uh, in charge. So access to that film was very, very difficult. It took about a year and a half uh, for us to approach the Ministry of Information, to approach the people uh, who were part of the constitution making process. Uh, Zimbabwe is a very um, closed society in terms of media. At that point, Mugabe had not allowed foreign media in the country for almost a decade. BBC was banned. Foreign journalists had a, a history of getting uh, arrested and uh, shipped out of the country. So uh, it was a long, uh, tedious, uh, interesting, but, but difficult process, of course, to allow me and my, my camera person to, to film. Um, our argument was that very few countries, like I'm from Denmark, we wrote our constitution hundreds of years ago. There's not much record about how this constitution was made. Uh, I'd say the same for the, the, the American constitution. There's many anecdotes and lots of legendary tales, but you know, what data do we have about how it was really produced? So I felt it was interesting to, to document such an important project. Um, uh, that that I was able to explain uh, easily, and because everybody was excited, except for Mugabe, but most people in the country was excited about this process about to happen. The difficult part was that there was no real history of observational or cinema filmmaking in Zimbabwe. 
uh, at that point. And so the idea of, uh, of, of making a film with this kind of omnipresence that you have when you make documentaries uh, the way I do um, was uh, not experienced before. A, a lot of documentary filmmakers uh, in Zimbabwe uh, have been used to going to a press conference, getting a statement from the regime, and then with archive and other stuff available, um, put their stories together. Uh, and that's, of course, because it's a dictatorship and information is sensitive and tightly controlled. But I think we, we, we made our case by first uh, approaching the opposition, who, of course, had a clear interest in having a a film made about their progressive project. And once they were on board, um, it was difficult for the regime to say that they also didn't want to be part of it. And then I think slowly, 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 over month and month and month of just hanging out without filming and and getting access. And I should say, I'm not the, the, the only person working on this. Uh, there were many people instrumental in, in clearing access for the first film. And that it finally uh, happened and we filmed for three years during the constitution making process and um, and made a film where sort of it was learning by doing we had to sort of explain every day why we were doing things the way we were and i think slowly we created an understanding amongst our participants that this is is a is a, is a different way of making film that we are used to but we are we are open to it and I think this work uh, then again helped us in the making of the sequel, uh, President, uh, which is the one we are premiering at, at CBH Docs, because uh, we had sort of already spent so much time in the country and had gained the trust from our participants. So the second film actually took only about five minutes for the protagonists and uh, some of the participants to agree to be part of the movie. So it's two very different scenarios in terms of access. But I think the labor and the, the, the understandings and the time we spent and the trust we gained in the first film was what helped us in the second film. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's what I read about uh, what this topic was and what we were discussing. I was so it was so interesting to me because you'd been documenting this process, you know, what's going on in Zimbabwe before really kind of the rise of, of social media, um, of these post-truth narratives, which we now see all over the world. Um, so a uh, couple questions, and then we should probably get to a clip too, because um, we have mm -hmm. a few clips to show. But um, I, the, my first question is, is so, so we saw in the film the role, uh, you know, you, you you use news reports to help show what you know the process and where we were and to you know uh, as opposed to you know obviously not a narrator but to give us uh the lead up and the aftermath um mm -hmm. is social media a factor in zimbabwe was it a factor in uh in the uh, in the election and how people were understanding the the process Mm. When you when you say a factor, I can say yes, it's definitely a factor. Social media has exploded in Zimbabwe because a lot of the um, non-social media, traditional media, television, radio, newspapers, etc., are controlled by the ruling government, and it's been very difficult for people with a different opinion uh, to get a platform to express themselves. So so once everybody. Uh, it's got access to the internet, have have a, a smartphone, uh, and logged onto uh, Facebook or WhatsApp. I'd say that that there was a kind of explosion of social media in Zimbabwe, uh, which is still there. Uh, you know, it's 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 a it's kind of the only tool there is if you disagree with with the government. Um, but when you say f you know factor, yes, it's a factor. There, you know, loads of of the base and people are engaging on social media. Um, but the problem is in terms of can it create change or how can it be a tool for the population to to address some of the concerns they have since national media is not uh, available to them. Um, I'd actually say no, because the the, the, the the fact that it's it's a military dictatorship and I dare 
put that thing out that it's still a military dictatorship even after Mugabe has gone means that the, the military is involved in everything. Also what's printed in the newspaper. And of course you can share your opinion uh, on, on WhatsApp or uh, in social groups uh, on, on Facebook, but it's not going to change much. Uh, Zimbabwe is ruled by the gun. And and um, and there's also, I say, in the last six months, when since uh, the government has been a bit under pressure, um, there's been a heavy crackdown on activist opposition members, others who are expressing uh, opinions different from opinions that are different from the regime on social media. Um, a political activist and, and friend of mine, a uh, filmmaker as well, was arrested recently for just making a tweet about the fact that there's corruption in the country, which we all know. Um, and they came and took his camera and sort of completely disarmed him as an activist and a filmmaker for a tweet. So, so how effective it is in terms of change, I'm not so sure, but it's there. And I think it has a, uh, I think it's a good place for people to vent, you know, to, to talk and discuss ideas. But in terms of creating lasting change or building a sustainable democracy in Zimbabwe, I'm afraid that the power of the gun and the, the force of the military is still uh, what's keeping things uh, at where it is. Should we go to uh, one of the clips? Um, yes. Um, I can maybe set it up a bit because I, I'm assuming that, that people who are watching today have not necessarily seen our film besides the trailer. So maybe I should just set it up because I think it's it's uh, interesting in terms of, of, of discussing truth. And, and um, maybe I just also preface it to, uh, you know, you, we're talking about cinema verite and I'm, I'm glad you you called uh, uh, our talk, you know, you prefaced it with a contemporary cinema verite because as you see in my trailer and you'll see in this in this clip, um, we use music, the, the film is edited in a three-act structure and we're using a lot of tools from the, from the, the, the genres that are usually characterizing fiction work. Uh, and I'm not sure if, if Sean Rouge or Albert Maisels would approve that this is pure cinema verite, but, but this is the scene that I chose because I think it's, 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 a, it's a moment where um, cinema verite has its force. And the force for me is that you are there in the now and you document what happens now. And we are at uh, the first election here in this clip after Mugabe was ousted in, in the military dictatorship uh, in 2017. It's election night um, and the results are, are about to declare who has become the, the, the president of, of, of Zimbabwe. Uh, they have read out nine out of 10 provinces. So we are just waiting for the last province to declare the winner. And suddenly the head of the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission decides to take a break. She gets a little note and she calls the event off and says she'll come back in an, in, in an hour. And we are with our protagonist here, uh, members of the opposition movement, um, who are not happy about the, the status or the results that have been read out. So maybe if you can play clip one, please. Do we address the presser now or we wait for... No, no, you need to discredit them before they announce, if we could. So let us go. Is it time or? Attention to members of the press. We would like to give a short statement. Uh, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. Uh, difficult times in our country, but uh, we will get there. Uh, I'll introduce uh, our chairperson, uh, Senator Komichi, to come and give you a brief statement. Good evening, gentlemen, and ladies. Good evening, gentlemen, and ladies. We reject the results because 
the results that have been announced have not been verified by us. I did not sign those results. So the results are fake. The results have been just been printed and they have not been verified by the polling agent. Thank you very much. The point is made. Thank you. We will announce it. This is a coup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a coup. This is a coup. They've just carried out a coup. In watching that scene, uh, when I watched the film, I, I was struck that they defied, that they went on and said, you know, declared it was a coup. This is the election has been rigged so early. Um, and uh, it brings up a question, right? Uh, and I'm here in the, uh, the US, so we have had our own um, our own struggles and insurrections uh, just recently and our own challenges to our democracy. Uh, we mm -hmm. have our past president who has declared, you know, that the election was stolen. Um, and we have, uh, even though the, you know, uh, Biden won, President Biden won, there's still a large majority, not majority, but a large swath of the population that believes that the election was illegitimate based on, on nothing. Um, I mean, it's, it's a, a fact based on nothing. So it's very interesting hearing the, um, the MDC declare that it was, uh, uh, you know, that this was a, a, a stolen election. It wasn't fair. I mean, and they have, you know, some evidence that they try to bring into court. Um, but what are your thoughts about that? <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> this idea that, you know, that elections can be declared, you know, you, you can, you can say an election is unfair and, you know, illegitimate and people can believe it based on facts or not. Um, mm -hmm. What does that mean for the, the filmmaker in trying to show, you know, you as a filmmaker and trying to show, you know, real problems with, with these, with the elections and, mm. and the process. Yeah, well, the, 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 the fact that uh, Trump, um, uh, well, maybe I should just go back a little bit. When, when in, in November, December and January last year, when we were just finishing the edit of, of President, um, a film about a stolen election in, in Zimbabwe, where our hero or our protagonist actually had a just cause. I believe the election was stolen for him. There is proof that it, the election was stolen. Um, and my main concern at that point was like, how do we get the rest of the world to, how do we get the international community who had been there as international observers, had overseen the process, agreed it probably wasn't entirely free or fair, but le sort of left again. And, and uh, in my opinion, left the, the job undone. In the final stages of editing the film or completing the film, you start to think about distribution strategies. And, and I was certain that nobody in the world, except for Zimbabweans and, and perhaps myself, would care about the fact that there was this great injustice that happened at the election in 2018. And then uh, end of November, December, January, when Trump started his The Election Was Stolen For Me show, um, I got even more nervous because uh, one thing was that you started to debate the independence of electoral commissions, ballot papers, postal votes. I mean, everything that we were dealing with in a very local Zimbabwean context was suddenly reflected on CNN every evening. Um, but my concern was that our protagonist, uh, who I portray as a, as a hero or a good guy in the movie who, with a just cause, he was suddenly being mirrored in who was perceived in most uh, circles, uh, in, in my world at least, uh, as a villain. I mean, my, my protagonist, Nelson Chamisa, was suddenly directly mirroring himself in Donald Trump. And I felt uh, that the, the, the fact that you, that you could just sort of be in a, in a, in a post-truth world, like Trump did come out and say this election was stolen without any proof, um, really damaged 
our story in a serious way? Would would because we didn't believe Trump, and would that mean that now people would also not believe Nelson Chamisa, who had a, a real cause? Um, that's in terms of the film, which is sort of a microcosm of, of the whole thing. The real concern is, of course, how can you, as, as, as a young Democrat in Zimbabwe, with a real experience of a stolen election, any, even get anyone to pay attention to this with the, with the, with the Trump scenario? Um, I, for me personally, and I think and I hope the discussion and the, 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 the thinking that we will take from these scenarios, we screened the film like you said, at Sundance in January, where this had just happened and Capitol Hill had just been attacked on January 6. And the responses from American audience was that this is almost too much. It's too close to home. But I think that what I, I hope what we can take out of this and what we can discuss and maybe what my film can ha highlight, even if it takes place in a country that's very far away from, from most of us, is the importance of uh, having independent institutions. Um, Chamisa lost in Zimbabwe uh, with a with a with a situation in a situation where the the election commission was not free, the courts are not free, the military and the police are controlled by the government. What saved America, what saved the uh, the election, uh, was of course that the American court system is independent and turned out to be independent, at least in this particular case. Even though Trump threw a lot of evidence uh, towards them, none of the judges acknowledged that there was a threat of, of evidence in this. And I think it did make people think about something as unsexy or complex as what's the importance of independent, independent constitutions. And, and that's what our film is about. It's about what happens when you don't have independent constitutions. And I hope that in the future life of president, that the fact that we in our part of the world have had a situation that mirrored the Zimbabwe situation, maybe help us relate to the Zimbabwean story uh, more easily. Absolutely. Do we have time for one more clip? Um, I would love to. That's up to, yeah, I think I think if we have, we maybe we could squeeze one, one more in. Uh, then let's take clip number two, please. ACM Channel 4 News. All right. Look at this. What is this? Go walk in Vinda. I Vinda. I would say that's it. Oh, let's go. 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 Wow. Let's go. We're here for a press conference with Nelson Chamisa, and as you can see, the riot police have just turned up. So this is a democracy. Where are you shut down? Shoving her in a remarkable event. Where is she? 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 Uh, you know, when it works for the government um, and does the government's bidding uh, is is problematic. Though I will have to say, speaking from, you know, where my perspective here in the U.S. as and especially as an African-American person, uh, we've seen finally the world is seeing the problems with uh, even when we do have independent, supposedly independent institutions, um, uh, you know, I'm speaking specifically around the police and, you know, the mm -hmm. the police mm -hmm. brutality that we have always had here. So, so these problems are not just in, uh, you yeah. know, in Africa, in Zimbabwe. Yeah. These are problems that we face here um, mm -hmm. as well. Obviously, you know, with mm -hmm. different, you know, different iterations mm -hmm. and extents, but I just want to uh, put that out there. Has the film and will the film be seen in Zimbabwe? Yeah, it, it, it not not yet. Um, uh, um, but maybe I'll just like to go back to the clip and, and, and just say a few words about why I, I chose it. 
uh, and and then I'll get back to the the other question, because uh, in talking about truth and post truth and and cinema verite, um, um, when the 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 current president of Zimbabwe removed President Mugabe from power in a military coup in 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 2017, he spent a lot of effort up till election day to convince the, the 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 Western world, the international community, that he was you know building a democracy, founding a new democracy in Zimbabwe. He had a PR company in London selling him as a Democrat because for the past 38 years, he's been Mugabe's henchman. So it was a bit of a project, I think, PR wise to sort of reboot this guy from, you know, spy chief henchman and, and, and one of the, the, you know, with a nickname crocodile, one of the one of the harshest people in Mugabe's government was suddenly having to sell himself as a true Democrat. And I'm quite impressed with the effort that he made. I mean, the entire international community, the EU, kind of believed that he was the right man for, for the job. And he also managed to have an election, pre-electoral process up until election day, where it was peaceful, uh, the opposition could meet um, without restrictions, and sort of everybody was starting to say, well, maybe he has changed, maybe he is a good guy, maybe he is really, uh, someone who's been under the gun of President Mugabe for so many years, but having a burning democratic heart inside his chest, and now it's all showing. And why I'd like to show this clip is that, you know, in, and, and he managed to do that. He really managed to convince the international community that he was a good guy up until this moment where he's stolen the election from the opposition candidate and who is about to have a press conference at a, at a, at a hotel in Harare. And when riot and and they weren't happy about that, you know, the, the the regime hadn't gone to a place where they were ready to have an opposition candidate say it's not true, you did steal the election and I am the winner. And their way to deal with that was sort of old regime method: send in riot police, and 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 uh, and stop the event. You know, we, if we don't want to hear the truth, we'll just use force to stop it. And what I thought was interesting about this choice was that, you know, how could they not have thought about that it was the press conference with 200 international journalists present? You know, when you're trying to sell an, a, a, a country as a newborn democracy, it's very difficult when you throw in riot police with sticks in front of rolling cameras. So for me, this was actually the moment in the election in 2018 when the thin, thin veneer of Munangagwa's democracy project completely uh, fell apart and the mask came on. And I think that this is, we're talking about, you know, the relevance of observational cinema, uh, the, the relevance of being present in, in the now. And I think this is a story that in a few minutes till, as a microcosm, tells more about the election in 2018 than, than anything else. And it wasn't reported anywhere else. I mean, I was shocked that, that reporters didn't use this footage, that it wasn't the story. Um, um, and so, you know, I just made a, uh, uh, an example of, of how the, the, the constant rolling cameras, the, the presence of this observational camera, I think, are able to tell different stories than, than what we hear from mainstream media. And then to your questions about Zimbabwe, of course, because this is a film uh, primarily made for a Zimbabwean audience. Um, or it's twofold. Of course, it's 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 an activist film, and and injustice was done. And my aim is to, to to make people uh, focus on on what has happened, but it's also very much a story for 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 Zimbabweans who are because of the political situation having a very difficult time to tell these stories right now themselves. Mm, like I said before, a, a friend of mine was uh, arrested for for a tweet. And so the idea of combining a two-hour story that disagrees with the narrative of the government is, is not easy or I'd almost say almost impossible. Um, so therefore, to get the film out in Zimbabwe is for us the, 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 the main agenda. Um, unfortunately, I have a, a history with this and my first film was banned by Mugabe's censorship board. And um, and of course we need to think about how we do this this time. So it's 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 in progress. But more details about exactly how we're going to do it, I I prefer not to to share at this stage. For, Got it. And for for yeah, okay, <laughs> not to preempt the strategy. Yeah, no, mm. of course. Um, I think I know the answer to this question, but it is from the audience. Uh, do you see journalists and filmmakers there um, 
are they, even in between your last film and this film, um, or even now, are they feeling more able, more uh, ability to report critically about the government? Is it about local filmmakers and journalists, the question? Yeah, local filmmakers in Zimbabwe. Yeah. No, unfortunately, no. Yeah. Unfortunately, the, the, the answer is that uh, although that you know, journalists and filmmakers and storytellers in general felt they had a very, very hard time during Mugabe's presidency. The story I hear from, from my colleagues there is that now is even worse. Uh, there's mm -hmm. such a big paranoia in the regime that, uh, that people are imprisoned, are beaten up um, in a much more violent way that, that, uh, that they were during uh, Mugabe's day. So the situation right now is, is not good, I'm afraid to say. Um, Mm. So, so no, that's just, that's, that's the short answer. It's a difficult, it's um, a very difficult place to practice. Yeah. Journalism. Yeah. There's no freedom of speech. I, I, Zimbabweans say we may have freedom of speech, but we don't have freedom after speech, which means that you can say what you want, but they're going to come and pick me up. So, right. so it's difficult. Right. Mm. Um, as we wait for uh, more questions from the, from the audience, I have, when you, when you, uh, you've been talking about the local filmmakers and journalists, how, if you can talk a little bit about how you worked with um, the local, uh, you know, crew or filmmakers or journalists, I think that's important in terms of how we talk about documenting democracy, especially if we're outsiders um, and, you know, not from that country, how we, how we can work or empower the local um, journalists and filmmakers to, you know, uh, to, 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 do, to do it as well. Absolutely. Um, a, a film like Democrats or like President is a, is a huge production. And, and uh, you know, I do sound and direct the movie and I have a cameraman uh, also from Denmark who helps me. But the rest of the people involved in making this film uh, are Zimbabweans who are helping us out on the ground. It's, it's, it's a huge network of people that we met during the making of the first film that's made President possible. And I'm talking about not just um, uh, people who, who drive us around and people who sort of take, help us with, with the practicalities of filming in a, in a foreign country, but there's, also, there's a whole sort of uh, network of people who help us to know where to be at the right time. I mean, the government of Zimbabwe is not sending me a message to say that they have a press conference. So my work is relying on a whole system of, of local uh, activists and journalists and people who know that it's difficult to, to operate for someone uh, like me, but who also know that we are maybe the chance for them to get the story out because it's so so dangerous for themselves. So if you look at the credits of our film, there are about 20 credits that are anonymous and all those are brave uh, uh, Zimbabweans who have uh, been instrumental in the in the making of this film. For their safety reason, I can't say so much more about exactly who they are and what they do, but only acknowledge that, of course, it's a huge collaborative project. Um, and we hope that one day when Zimbabwe is a free democratic state and there's nothing to fear, that we can reprint the credits of our film and give everybody who's been involved in the making of the film, their proper credits. I, I, I've been promised by my producer that we will do that as soon as we can, but for now, it's just not safe. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, are you planning on continuing your documentation, your films about Zimbabwe and its process? To be honest, I didn't even think I was going to make this film. I thought when I had made the first film, Democrats, I was, I was on, I was doing, working on some theater in Berlin, and I had another project lined up that I had worked on to prepare for for a year and a half. Um, this film came about because the first film was banned, and I went to Zimbabwe, and we unbanned the film through a lengthy court process, and it was during a celebration dinner in Harare that the protagonist of my first film said. Why don't you come back for the next election? And, and, and this time, for sure, we'll get a happy end to the, to the story. And, uh, and, and that's the reason why I, I, I made it. Um, another film in Zimbabwe, I think, unfortunately, that my situation will be difficult after the release of this film in Zimbabwe. I don't think I'll be welcome for, for a while. 
Um, but I hope also with, with, with these two films that we've made, that we've created a, a record for Zimbabweans to think about this decade of politics in their lives. And, and in a democratic Zimbabwe with a democratically elected president, I would hope that a local filmmaker could take the the, the, the stick and carry on the, the, the project um, and, and would be safe to do so, would have freedom of expression both before and after. Um, Wonderful, Camila. We are getting down to our last 10 seconds. I can go on and on <laughs> about this film and about your work, but thank you so much. And thank you to CPH for, for having us and everyone go watch this film. Thank you. Thank you, Yoruba Richen and Camilla Nielsen for this excellent conversation, this important conversation. We hope for a happy end in real life, uh, Camilla, and uh, for you to be free to make uh, your next films also.